Turn your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 2 as we continue to study the book of Romans verse by verse. We are in Romans chapter 2 verse 25 and as you're turning there, I'll remind you that evening worship is at 6 o'clock and Sunday evenings uh, we are studying the gospel of John verse by verse and I think that, that will bless your life if you'll come and place yourself in front of the word of God. Romans uh, chapter 2 uh, beginning at verse uh, 25, remember uh, that Paul is sort of talking to two groups sitting in the Church of Rome. And he talks to Gentiles and he reminds them of why uh, they need Jesus. And now he's going to talk to historical uh, Jews and tell them why they also need Jesus. And both uh, different people uh, have different uh, concerns and why it is that they think that they might be able to bypass uh, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so now he is speaking uh, to Jews in particular and the things that Jews uh, prior to accepting Christ had learned to trust uh, for their righteousness. And so uh, that will hopefully help us make sense of the passage. Beginning in verse 25. For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. Now, if, if you're new to Christianity or new to your Bible, uh, I, I always have these images in my head. You went to church for the first time in your life, and you came home and they said, well, what the guy talk about? And, and you say, hey, circumcision. <laughs> and you know, it's like, wow, that's weird. <laughs> And I appreciate that, but you understand that the Bible uh, doesn't begin in the book of Romans. It begins in the book of uh, Genesis, uh, and uh, it's a long history. We're talking about thousands of years of history, and circumcision was there uh, for a reason. Uh, and so he's discussing the historical uh, uh, practice of circumcision, uh, and I'll explain this a little bit more, but don't get weirded out until I do, okay? Uh, circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, and he's talking about the Ten Commandments, and remember, he's talking to people who have been historically Jewish, who are now uh, Christians. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. In other words, obedience to the law of God is not about uh, how you look physically or what physical religious ritual you participated in, but uh, obedience to the law is about something else entirely. That's the point that he's making in verse 26. So, if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? That would have been completely objectionable uh, to uh, a Jewish uh, listener. Uh, they would say, you mean to tell me that if a Gentile obeys the law of God, someone who has not been circumcised, he is just the same as I am in the household of God? And Paul's answer is going to be, yep. Circumcision is not what distinguishes uh, you at all. Uh, then he who is physically uncircumcised in verse 27, but keeps the law, is worse than he's just equal. He will condemn you who have written the written code in circumcision, but go ahead and break the law. You have all this historical revelation. Uh, you were given the law of God, the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Uh, you were given the sign and seal of the promise of God uh, in circumcision. And even though you have all of that, it means nothing if you don't care about following Christ. It means nothing. Uh, for uh, no one, and, and this is uh, a verse that uh, I wished I could imprint on every Christian publisher for the last 50 years with a goofy science fiction kind of Christianity that they've come out with in these books on the end times. For no one is a Jew, no one is a Jew, who is merely one outwardly. What makes you a Jew? He's using this as a metaphor. Nor is circumcision outward and physical. It's not. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, accomplished by the Spirit, not by the letter. In other words, not by the law. And that person's praise is from man, but uh, not from man, but from God. Uh, this is the word of the Lord. So we've heard a lot about fake news, right? Everything's fake news. Uh, I don't follow, and you'll be pleased to know this, women's soccer. <laughs> 
it's not a favorite sport of mine or anything like that, but you know, they're, they're in the news a lot because of their political stance. And one of the more famous ones, again, whose name I don't remember and probably won't try to learn, but uh, her face was in the news because she wanted everybody to know that all that was reported about the women's soccer team in this last match, which they lost, was fake. It's fake news. Uh, and so uh, now uh, we are sort of in a cultural position where we are uh, invited to distinguish between whatever we hear as something that's fake or something that's uh, genuine. Uh, and that puts you in the driver's seat, but it also puts you in an awkward position, because how do you know? And the truth is you don't. Uh, we just take someone's word for it. Well, that's fake. Well, not only is there fake news, but there is fake Christianity. Uh, you know, uh, I love people saying, you know, I don't, I don't go to church, you go to church and that foolishness and, and I can't imagine if you go to that church and then they give you four or five reasons why they don't go to church and it's like, well, if that's Christianity, I wouldn't go either. But what you're describing is not Christianity, you're describing fake Christianity and then what you've done is abandoned the counterfeit. Well, good for you, I would abandon the counterfeit as well. But that isn't the question. The question is, have you interacted knowingly with the authentic? Do you know what's genuine? Do you know what's real? Uh, and that was the confusion uh, that was in the Church of Rome. Uh, they thought, well, it means one thing to be a Christian, and Paul says, well, no, it means something else. And so what you're doing is uh, participating in fake uh, Christianity, uh, fake believing. Uh, and, of course, we all have the same problem, uh, and I can give you sort of the three ways that we end up with fake uh, Christianity. Uh, we'll say, first of all, I uh, know I'm a Christian, and this is fake Christianity, okay? We're doing fake first. This is fake. <laughs> this is the fake part. So fake Christianity starts like this. Well, I believe in better stuff than you do. Yeah, good for you. Uh, secondly, uh, I practice better rituals than you do. Fabulous. That's great. Or uh, I obey better rules than you do. Now that summarizes fake Christianity. Uh, and people uh, propose this stuff and act like it's real. You know, I know better stuff than you, I know more than you, I have better rituals than you do, you know, I, there are things that I won't eat on Friday that other people do, but I'm holier because I do. Uh, I have fake rituals. Um, and then, of course, I have uh, kind of obeyed better rules than you have. Everybody has rules, but mine are better than yours. Now, that is the way that most people talk about their Christian life. As if what it means to be a Christian uh, is that you have understood things better than someone else. Or what it means to be a Christian is that whatever your particular religious practices are, are somehow superior to other people's religious practices. Or uh, to be a Christian uh, is about the obedience, but not obedience uh, in general, but obedience to the particular rules that you have decided, uh, make for better Christianity. And I have great news for you this morning. I'm going to let you all off the hook for that. If that has any recognition value for you at all, um, it would be really important for you right now to hit the delete button. You have a little delete button in your head? Hit it. Get it out of there. Clean it out and let's start over. Because that's what the book of Romans is doing in its totality. Uh, so uh, Paul is going to say, listen, the reason uh, that you get into this mess is because you don't understand what real faith is built on. And he's going to uh, remind uh, them why they're Christians. They're not Christians because they got circumcised and the other guy didn't. They're not Christians because they were the happy recipients uh, of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai and, you know, the other guys uh, didn't get that. That is not what makes you a believer. That is not uh, what makes you a true and authentic member of the household of God. Uh, and so this is what Paul is saying uh, in this passage. You are a believer today not because, first, you were superior to anybody else. You got something from God that someone else didn't get. That's not what makes you a believer. Uh, the second thing he says, uh, you are not a believer today, uh, not because you're religious. 
That's not what uh, makes you a reliable member of the household of God. You're not superior, and you're not religious. And then the third thing he says, and this is the one that strikes us, because uh, it doesn't matter what I say. So far, most of you are like, okay, fair enough, yeah, good, good, good. But then the third thing, you're not a believer because you're obedient. Oh, don't I have to be a little bit obedient? Yeah, but we'll talk about how that comes to pass. But obedience is not what earned you your way into the household of God. So uh, you are a believer this morning if you're sitting in the sanctuary for the same reason everybody else is a believer uh, in the book of Romans. Not because you were superior in any way, not because of uh, you're religious and the other guy isn't, and not because you're obedient and the other guy isn't. So let's kind of look at this passage and see what the Lord has for us. First of all, you're not a believer because you're superior to somebody else. Now, if you ask uh, people why they're Christians, they try to look humble. Well, why did the Lord save you? Well, and I like to put the question in another way. Why are you a Christian but your next door neighbor isn't? And answer it honestly. And we'll have all kinds of fuzzy uh, little ways to characterize that. Well, he just hasn't seen the light yet. Which means you did? Well, he struggles with some issues. Which means you don't? Well, he just doesn't come to a full understanding. Because you're so insightful? Is that what distinguishes you from your next door neighbor who is not a believer? And the truth is, in practice, those are the sorts of rationales that come easily flowing out of us. And at some level, and if you use the right tone of voice, because as you know, you're a better Christian if you talk like this. <laughs> if you use the right tone of voice, you can say the most arrogant, ridiculous thing possible. <laughs> and people will still credit you for spirituality. <laughs> it's like, uh-uh. So uh, this is the problem uh, that those who had been formerly Jews, who had now come to Christ, what they brought with them to the church at Rome was a sense of superiority. Here they are, sitting in the pew. I don't think they had pews, but maybe stone benches. And they are saying to themselves, isn't it nice that God also included those stupid Gentiles? I mean, that's really nice of him to do. Because after all, he didn't have to do that. But I am here today because I am circumcised of the household of Abraham. And not only that, I have been the recipient of the revelation of God himself. Uh, as I am a, a Jew who has received the direct revelation of God on Mount Sinai to Moses, the law of God. And at some level, as they sat there in the pew, they said to themselves, I'm better than the guy next door to me because of that. And that's precisely what Paul is trying to undermine. Because we are not saved, and hear this now, you are not saved because you are special. You are special because God saved you. Amen. You see the difference? Uh, your superiority, uh, your uh, uh, spiritual legacy, your spiritual history did, and I want you to hear this, did nothing to contribute to Christ's redemption of your soul. It did nothing. Because Christianity is Jesus plus nothing. We don't make a contribution. Now I know, I grew up in the full gospel church. Now, you may not know this because you people are so nice. <laughs> but if someone comes to town and they put 
on the door. We are a full gospel church. What do they mean by that? That the rest of you knuckleheads have the partial gospel. That's what that means. And the reason I know that is because, did I mention I grew up there? <laughs> and oh, those poor people who don't have the full gospel. Oh, how pitiful it is that poor Spurgeon didn't have the full gospel. And Billy Graham, what a shame. What a shame. That's the kind of thinking that uh, isn't just unique to where I grew up, but it's unique to everybody. You go into your dyed-in-the-wool Baptist church today. I thank God that I was raised a Baptist. Why do you thank God for that? <laughs> they're not saying they're actually are grateful for being a Baptist. They're actually grateful that they're a Baptist and you're not. Do you see the difference? It's this spiritual smugness that everybody engages in that thinks that were it not for your history, then poor Jesus wouldn't have had much to work with. As if when Christ, through his redeeming power on the blood of Calvary, uh, said, I am going to save them by my own power and my own might. As if in the eternal counsels of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, the inscrutable counsels of God, uh, in conversation, uh, the Father says to the Son, there's a good one. We probably need him on the team. Uh, that guy, not so much. No, 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 no. That's not how it works. Uh, we are saying, and that's exactly what Moses reprimanded Israel for thinking. Do you remember Deuteronomy 7-7? Uh, seven, seven? Just let me read it to you. It, this is God speaking because this attitude of smugness has been around since there were believers. It was not, and I'm quoting now Deuteronomy 7.7, 7, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. The Lord said, I didn't choose you because you were bigger, stronger, smarter, and, or in any way more superior to any of your neighbors. In fact, I chose you because you weren't. Not many wise, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. That's always the principle. So Jesus says the exact same thing, and you would expect them not to contradict each other. When Jesus in John chapter 15 says, you didn't choose Choose me, I chose you. And he did it not because we were superior in any way or special in any way. He did it because he set his love on us because he set his love on us. He loved us because he loved us. And anything less than that becomes a quid pro quo. He didn't love you because you were something. He loved you when you were nothing. And that's the gospel. And if you let any little thing seep into your mind that says, the reason I'm a Christian today is because I am somehow unique and the poor other guy isn't, that is an opportunity for arrogance that you don't want in your Christian life. Now, uh, you are a Christian today not because uh, you are more superior, but not only that, uh, you are a Christian today not because you are more religious. Uh, you see what uh, he says here. Uh, so if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his circumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised, but go has and does keep the law, actually condemns you who have the written code, who have the law, and circumcision, but break the law. Okay, people are looking at me like, what, what, did, he, what did he just say? <laughs> and I, I know, this is a little tricky in the 21st century talking about circumcision, right? So let me give you, I know people that I can't wait for this. What is this? <laughs> the guy goes on vacation, comes back, he talks to us about circumcision. <laughs> all right. I'm going to do this easy, all right? God called Abraham out of Babylon. That's where the Ur of the Chaldees are. 
uh, Abraham was a non-Jew pagan. There were no Jews then. So God calls Abraham and he sets his love on Abraham and Paul's going to later use that as an example in a couple of chapters. But uh, you have heard this from Genesis and Paul's going to repeat it uh, here in Romans. And it says that Abraham believed God and it was counted for him as righteousness. The way that Abraham became a believer is because God called him, effectual call, out of the Ur of Chaldees when Abraham wasn't looking. God set his love and attention on him, and Abraham believed, and that belief in God is what counted as his righteousness. Faith. Righteousness by faith. That happened before anything else happened. Then, and only after God had set his grace and mercy on Abraham, then and only after uh, uh, Abraham had trusted uh, uh, God alone for his righteousness, only then did God say, I'm going to make you a promise and you're uh, going to look up in the sky and you're going to have descendants, righteous descendants, not physical descendants, righteous descendants, as many as there are stars in the sky, and I want you now as a reminder of my promise to circumcise yourself and every male of every household. And from now on, you will be called something else. I'm going to change your name, and from now on, one of your sons will be called Israel, and you will be Jewish from now on. That's where it all began. Circumcision wasn't uh, a work that Abraham did that then earned the righteousness of God. Circumcision was a symbol and a sign of a righteousness already granted through the grace and sovereign mercy of Jesus Christ. Now what happens, and it didn't take that long, but let's just say we're sitting, you know, Abraham is 2000 BC, and, and uh, Paul is writing uh, uh, to the church at Rome in around 55 AD. And, uh, you know, by then it's been 2000 years, and you, and you forget that the promise preceded the sign. And pretty soon you forget the promise, but what you trust is not the promise of God. What you begin to trust is just the sign itself. I'm participating in the right religious ritual, therefore I'm saved. People still do that. I baptized my kid, so therefore they're saved. Good luck. I became a member of First Church, therefore I'm saved. Good luck. Do you see the point? The point is we begin to trust the ritual. So I tell people the sign to New York is not New York. The sign points you to something else. The sign of circumcision was to point them, to remind them of the promise of grace that God had given them. And once you arrive at the destination, the sign to the destination no longer becomes necessary. You're not standing on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan saying, where's the sign to New York? It's dumb. Right? But Christians do that. I'm in Christ, but where's the sign to Christ? No, no, no. You don't need the sign once you've arrived at the destination. And so circumcision was temporary, as all Old Testament signs were. The temple was temporary. Why? Because it pointed you to the presence of Jesus Christ. Now that Jesus has come, you don't need the temple. That's why it was destroyed. The sacrifices were temporary. Why? To point out and to teach as an object lesson that blood would have to be shed, that it was going to be a high price for your redemption. But once Jesus, the Lamb of God, comes, you know, the sacrifices are no longer necessary and they won't be reinstituted by the way. So the fact of the matter is, the signs were always temporary, but once the symbol of the sign comes, you don't need the sign anymore. And that's why over and over again the prophets would tell the Israelites, I didn't want you sacrificed, didn't you know that? I didn't want you, that was a stench in my nostrils. And now that Christ is here, we don't have to. I, participate in the signs. And so in the New Testament, circumcision is never contrasted with baptism. It's always contrasted with faith. 
which is why we don't baptize our children until they confess Christ. The fact of the matter is, circumcision or uncircumcision is always contrasted with saving faith. And that's the point that he makes here. Your saving faith is not material to the fact that you participated in this sign. So what he's trying to tell people is this. Don't confuse superstition with spirituality. And that's what people do. It's so much easier to go to church. It's so much easier uh, to sing the right hymn. It's so much easier to participate in a religious ritual, light the candles, do whatever it is that you do. I mean, you know, I'll step on toes if I start naming them. But the fact of the matter is, it's so much easier to do that than to follow Jesus. Anybody can do that nonsense. Anybody. But follow Jesus? Oh, that's the narrow road. That's the hard way. It's not going to be so easy as adopting some religious ritual. You're going to have to get into a relationship with someone who speaks to you and tells you yes or no. Worship, remember, how do you know the difference between superstition and spirituality, by the way? Uh, you begin to worship the symbol instead of the one symbolized. That's always the case. And so you'll care more about the fact that you're a Baptist than you'll care about the fact that you have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You'll care more that you're reformed than you'll care about the fact that Jesus reformed you through his indwelling spirit. You'll care more uh, that you speak in tongues and the other guy doesn't uh, than you'll care about the fact that Jesus Christ, through his Spirit, indwells sinners. You'll care about the wrong thing. You'll begin to worship the symbol instead of what and who the symbol represents. And this is exactly what was being discussed uh, in uh, the Psalms. You remember, this is not a new idea. Let me just read you the Psalms. It's possible to be extremely religious and extremely wicked at the exact same time. Extremely religious and extremely wicked. Let me read Psalm 50 to you. To the wicked, God says, What right have you to recite my statutes or take my covenant on your lips? For you hate discipline, and you cast my words behind you. The issue isn't uh, that you are participating in all the right rituals. The issue is you're not paying any attention to what Jesus said. And so it's easy to go to church and do that, isn't it? It's easy to go to church and not realize that what scriptures say to you is what God says to you. And if you don't do it, you're in deep trouble. Deep trouble. No, you're a Christian today, not because you're superior. And you're a Christian today, uh, not because you're religious. And finally, he says, uh, you're a Christian today, not because you're obedient. And that's a little bit controversial, because we think as Christians, we're supposed to obey God. But I uh, understand it, it this way, that these people were obedient, weren't they? They obeyed and got circumcised, and they circumcised their children. And then the whole discussion is around who is truly obedient. Do you see what he's distinguishing? He's saying uh, that those who truly obey the law versus those who only superficially obey the law. That's the contrast uh, that he's making. Then uh, he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law. In other words, he didn't obey the law of circumcision, but he keeps the law of God. That person actually condemns you, the one who has kept circumcision, uh, even though you have the written code uh, in circumcision, but you nevertheless don't listen to anything God says to you. And so uh, you are uh, not a believer because you've been obedient. And what he means is simply this, that godly obedience looks uh, like something. In other words, godly obedience versus the other kind. What people are really obeying is their own religious rituals, their own religion, their own goofy little rules. And they obey that, and then they give themselves credit for being a better Christian than the other guy. You're not a better Christian because you don't wear bell bottoms. 
That was actually a rule when I was growing up, so I thought I'd throw that out. You don't even believe it's true. <laughs> it's true. And, I, you know, you're not a better Christian because you don't drink a glass of wine and someone else does. That's going to be the whole point of Romans 14. You're not a better Christian. That's not what it is because you made up some rule and then you decide to be obedient to your man-made rule. It isn't about man-made rules. It's about what God says. So godly obedience versus the other kind is something that operates from the inside out. Do you see what he says? For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly. That's not what counts. Nor is circumcision outward and physical. In other words, circumcision was just a sign. Now he's saying, this is what you have to understand. Circumcision was designed to be a symbol of something much deeper than that. And it was what Jeremiah called the circumcision of your heart. And so he says, but a Jew, a real Jew, the only kind of Jew, is not genetic at all. The only kind of Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit. In other words, it's something that the Spirit does for you. And so true obedience is from the inside out. It's not outside in. True obedience to God is something that happens in your heart and then moves out into your behavior. And this is the scourge of our generation. They are hunting for an identity and they think that their behavior creates an identity, but that's not true. That's backwards. Your identity is what propels your behavior. And so you can change your behavior, you can change your clothes, you can change your gender, but you're going to still wake up and you're you. And you're you without God. And until you get right with God, your behavior is not going to do anything for that. Because it's an identity crisis that can only be solved by the God who created your identity. It's the only way. And we do this in our lives all the time. I know that I'll have a Christian identity if I do X, Y, and Z. That's not what makes you a Christian. You're a Christian because the Holy Spirit has entered your heart and He has applied the work of Calvary to your life. The shed blood of Jesus Christ has been poured over your wicked, evil, black heart. And now, behold, old things have passed away. All things become new. And you are a new creation in Christ. You have a new identity in Christ. That's what it means to be a Christian. And if you're not that kind of a Christian, forgive me, but you're not one at all. Because that's the only one that Christ saves. So how do I get obedient? It's not about obedience. Do you see what the point is? It's by the Spirit. He's talking about fellowship. Fellowship produces the obedience. You don't obey to get fellowship with God. You don't obey and then you earn your way into His presence. God gives you His presence in His Son, Jesus Christ, and He redeems you through His own grace and His mercy. And now, because He's present with you through the dwelling Spirit, you become changed naturally, almost involuntarily. We call it sanctification. And you begin to look more and more like who you're in fellowship with. Now, you take a kid from Maine, Abbott, and uh, you enlist him in the army, and you put him in Fort Nix, Dix, New Jersey, in basic training. And as you know, uh, the army does not look like anybody from Abbott, Maine. <laughs> and eight weeks later, that kid will come out of Fort Dix talking like he's a kid from the Bronx. <laughs> Why? Because who you hang around with is who you end up looking like. You know what your problem is this morning? Your problem isn't that you're not obeying enough. Your problem is you're not in fellowship enough with Jesus Christ. Because when you're in fellowship with Jesus Christ, when you know, love, and follow Jesus, you want what He wants. You love what He loves. You hate what He hates. And obedience, instead of being something that earns you into the relationship with Jesus, now because of the relationship with Jesus Christ, because you're in fellowship with Him through His Spirit, now begins to naturally change you from the inside out. And you'll wake up one morning and say, you know, I just don't want to do that anymore. Just not interested. And that's called sanctification, and that's called the work of the Spirit. And that's what these folks didn't get. I hope you get it this morning. 
You know why you're a Christian this morning? Because from all eternity, God set his love on you. And he didn't set his love on you because you're better than the next guy. You're not superior. And he didn't set uh, his love on you because you were more religious. And he looked down and said, oh, there's a churchgoer. I think I'll save them. And he certainly didn't set his love on you because you were obedient. No, while we were still dead in our trespasses and sins, God in his great love and mercy loved us from before the beginning of time and then redeemed us in time in Jesus Christ through his shed blood so that you would now be a child of God, no longer smug, no longer religious, but in a relationship and no longer trusting your own obedience, but trusting only the obedience of Jesus Christ and his grace towards you. That's what it means to be a Christian. Let's pray. Lord, this morning we're so grateful that you saved us. We didn't save ourselves. And so I pray that uh, you will search our hearts and teach us your ways for the sake of Jesus, I pray. Amen.